Okay, good morning, everyone, or technically good afternoon. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and uh, work within the Forest Connect program, uh, Forestry Extension and Applied Research from Cornell University. And one of our activities is a monthly webinar where we try to find some great speakers to give presentations on some great subjects that are useful to people that are boots on the ground, whether it's landowners or foresters or loggers or agency people. And uh, we've been running these webinars now since 2007. So we've got a pretty good go of it. And we have another great speaker today. Uh, Nick Rowell is with the Warren County, New York Soil and Water Conservation District. He's going to be talking about applications of GIS type technology and how to make use of it. We, uh, uh, Nick and I were chatting yesterday, I guess, and uh, he was showing me what he's going to be covering. It's, I'm excited to see it. And, and I explained to Nick that this, uh, and this is part two, his uh, coworker Jim Liebram gave part one two months ago. So it's September, and that's available on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. And uh, when, when I had learned about the uh, skill set that these guys had, I thought I need to learn this. I thought, wait, they and they explained that they do teaching in this. So I thought, I bet I can get some webinars out of this. So they both agreed uh, to my advantage and to your advantage. So with that, Nick, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to mute my microphone and look forward to seeing your presentation. Thanks very much for joining us. Certainly. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so uh, like Peter said, my name is Nick Rowell. I'm with the uh, Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm the natural resource specialist here. Uh, geez, I've been at the district now for a decade. Um, I started in kind of the GIS field in college. It was my minor. Um, and then from there, uh, I kind of bounced around from an engineer firm, a couple engineering firms, then landed with the district. Uh, and of course, uh, GIS um it's just a such a huge topic and everywhere i worked uh and all the fields that i've been in um so naturally i just kept moving forward with it and um we do quite a few trainings uh in the gis field so today i'm going to kind of show an overview um of some different applications some different ways to collect field data uh, and then utilize that field data in ArcGIS or QGIS. But really today I'm gonna focus on the QGIS um, side of things. So when I'm discussing GIS, I'll usually just say GIS, but it can apply to ArcGIS and QGIS. So ArcGIS is Esri ArcGIS. Uh, it's a program you have to purchase. Um, it is the number one mapping software out there. It's an extremely powerful program. Uh, used in many, many, many different fields. Uh, and then recently, I'm not even sure, geez, I've known about QGIS probably for the past six years. Uh, QGIS is an open source software, so it's free. Um, and it's constantly being updated. So it's pretty neat to uh, have an open source free software like QGIS because ArcGIS can be pretty complicated, um, but it also can be uh, fairly expensive. Um, so today, everything I show, I'll show, i show you uh, can be applied to both programs because they both use the same type of data and have very similar tools and organization. So GIS is Geographic Information Systems. Um, and kind of a, a quick overview, data management is very important when it comes to uh, dealing with GIS software. So how you save it, how you name it, where you organize it, where you keep that data, because the way GIS software works is it works on a path. So the map doesn't actually hold all the data. The map just holds a path to the data you're using. So say you save a map, you know, in one folder on your G drive, and then you move some data or move that map, and you, you know, cut and paste it somewhere, you'll break that file path. Um, so it's really important to save all of your GIS maps and all of your GIS data under one drive. And I always recommend a C drive. Um, and I'll show you how my data set is set up. Uh, so if you have everything on a C drive, if you ever change computers, 
you can just take that C drive, take your GIS drive and move it to a new computer uh, without breaking any paths and having all your maps still organized for you. Uh, we'll also talk about various places to find data because in order to build maps, you usually need the data unless you're collecting it in the field yourself. Um, so there's quite a few uh, different areas to find data, including um, the Syracuse, which is Cougar, uh, there's a New York State uh, GIS Clearinghouse, Web Soil Survey, I'm going to show an example to that of that today, County Planning Boards, GIS Departments, New York State DEC. Um, so there's a, a lot of different places to uh, get uh, data to utilize in maps. And then so there's uh, some different types of data that can be utilized. So raster data kind of made up of, of a matrix of so cells. So like high resolution photos is considered raster data. Um, so usually when you get high resolution photos, like aerial photos, they take a series of photos, stitch them together, and it gets processed into one image, which is the aerial photo you see, such as um, Google Earth. So this is raster data, uh, just so you have an idea of the two different types of data GIS uses. Vector data, that's your points, lines, and polygons. So whether you have streets on there, which would be lines, uh, collecting points, say for areas you find invasive species, you're collecting a point there, um, collecting a point at a certain tree. Um, polygons, so you could outline a water body would be in a polygon or outline a field. Um, so these are, this is considered vector data and it has a defined start and end point. Uh, so this is vector data. So we've got a lot of lines on here, contour lines. Uh, we've got parcels on here. So a parcel of actually at SUNY Adirondack, which will be my example today, outline some farm fields there. So that's all vector data. And then creating a GIS map, it's important to know you're kind of layering up a sandwich. So depending on how you organize those layers, uh, depends on what layers can be shown. So usually if you're going to use an aerial photo, you'll have that on the bottom. And then you put things on top like streets or hydrology. So your lakes and streams. Um, and then on top of that, you can put parcels so you can see outlines of property boundaries. And then you just layer that uh, in your map. And I'll be showing an example of this. So this is a, a, a map. You got your aerial photos in the back. So the aerial photo is the base layer. Um, so it's the bottom layer. And then I've got streams on there. And then I've got parcels. So this is the parcel line. And then I've got soils on there. Um, so it shows you how you can layer those, uh, that data to show a nice readable map. And then again, this map, uh, keeping maps fairly simple. These are the wetlands in and around SUNY Adirondack. Again, we got the aerial photo on there. I've got streams, I've got the wetlands file, still have the parcels and the fields on there. Um, so again, layering those photos so that you can see what's important on this map and the wetlands are uh, the most important on that map that I'm trying to show. This is often what I get requested to do on maps. So my you know, number one tip when starting out uh, creating GIS maps is keep it simple. Uh, people, if somebody's gonna ask you to make a map who's not used to making maps or using GIS software of any type, they'll ask you for the most complicated map. Show you know, 30 different data sets on there. And then at the end, you have a map that's not even readable or usable. Um, so this is usually what I get requested for. Instead, my recommendation is keep simple maps and do multiple maps instead of ending up with something like this, um, <laughs> which I'll make an engineering joke. This was an engineer that requested this map. Uh, but again, just far too much data. This needed to be broken up. Um, the scale needed to be much larger and then maybe multiple maps. This could have been probably at least three different maps. So it's important to know how these softwares uh, communicate in different applications. So I'm gonna show web soil survey, collecting that data and utilizing it in QGIS, but there's always a way a lot of these um, different programs will communicate with other programs, including uh, using a GPS and getting that GPS data into QGIS. 
you know, so kind of how does this, you know, field data mapping stuff work? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to collect field data. If you sat in on Jim's presentation in September, he showed you a few, a few different ways to collect data from a cell phone. So these are the, the different ways I've collected field data. Um, you using a Garmin GPS and then um, a free software, um, which is actually called DNR GPS now, not Garmin, uh, to get the data off the GI off the GPS and put into your map. Uh, we've used Trimble units. Uh, these are more higher end units, but they're very expensive, and the software to utilize them is very expensive. Um, so ours is kind of collecting dust uh, because we're now using um, ArcGIS online. So again, you can utilize you know, various softwares to collect the data. It just depends on uh, what kind of data you wanna collect. You know, price point is always you know, a debate. Uh, and then how accurate you need it. Um, if you're looking at you know, survey accuracy, which is very rare, I don't know, you know many people that need survey accuracy other than surveyors, um, you know, you're gonna be looking at a very high-end expensive Trimble unit. Um, for our office, we use our cell phones, um, we use GIS software, and that's how we collect the majority of our data with a, a external Garmin. So again, a, a super easy, simple setup for collecting uh, field data is just a very basic Garmin GPS. You know, for $200 and limited to no experience, uh, you can get a, a nice Garmin GPS get it, collect field data, and put it into a map fairly easy, easily uh, with limited experience, which is why I really like this setup. So using a Garmin GPS with QGIS software uh, as your um, mapping choice, it's very limited expense to uh, get up and running. DNR Garmin, which is nice, is a, or it's called now, since I've used, I haven't used it in a while, um, it's now called DNR uh, GPS. So this was developed by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And basically it just takes that, um, those waypoints off your Garmin GPS and converts them to a shape file, which is the data that is used in QGIS. I know this might sound like a lot now, but once I show you the tutorial, it'll kind of come together for you. Um, so it's nice that this free software is out there just to convert your data. It's like saving uh, Microsoft Word to a PDF. Um, all it is just uh, resaving that data to be uh, utilized in a different way. So again, super basic, super easy, free software. This is what DNR Garmin looks like, or DNR GPS. Um, and again, using this with, with QGIS, uh, you can easily take your field data and put it into a map. So this is, you know, what we've used this exact setup for. I had a very basic Garmin GPS. And when I bought it, I think it was like 150 bucks. Um, and that was seven years ago. Uh, and we've used QGIS since then as well. So uh, this is a map made in QGIS. We collected uh, aquatic invasive species information throughout Screen Lake uh, with that Garmin GPS, converted it with DNR Garmin. Uh, and then you just put it into your QGIS map. Um, and I'll show you that today. But again, this is, you know, five years of data I've collected using that exact setup. And then I would just reference each GPS, GPS point to a notebook. Um, and it was just that basic, uh, but it was quick and easy and very inexpensive. And then other things you can utilize. So now you can utilize cell phones for just about everything. Uh, your cell phone has a built-in, most smartphones have a built-in GPS. Uh, to make it slightly more accurate, you can buy a Garmin GPS or an external GPS. Um, and it's just a, a basic little handheld GPS that you turn on. It syncs to your phone with Bluetooth, uh, just like a speaker would. Um, and then it just makes your cell phone GPS that much more accurate. <clears throat> um, and again, accuracy may sound like a lot. You know, you'll hear people that first get into this, they're like, I need the most accurate information. Um, when really uh, I can get back to a storm drain in a road with, you know, eight feet of, of accuracy or, or, you know, like three meters, four meters of accuracy. Um, so you really don't need that accurate uh, of data to, 
you know, have a very uh, nice map and to be able to get to all the points uh, you're looking for. So this is uh, another way we've collected data. So we used a tablet and on the tablet, we had QGIS software on there. And what's nice about QGIS software is it will link to a GPS. So you can collect, you know, data using QGIS if you already have a tablet, um, which is really nice. And again, you would just use uh, an external GPS like the Garmin Glow right here, and it would just Bluetooth connect to your tablet. And then you have your map right in the field on a tablet and you're collecting data. Um, it's, it's really nice. And again, fairly inexpensive setup. Uh, a lot of people already have tablets. Uh, and then the QGIS software is free. So you would basically just be purchasing that external GPS. And in QGIS, this is how you link uh, your GPS to it. So they already have a GPS tool in there. Um, so you open that tool and you turn on your external GPS and hit connect. And then you're ready to add lines, you're added, ready to add points, polygons, whatever it may be, but you're collecting data on a map in the field, uh, which is really nice because you can have other layers out there, you know, uh, parcels. So, you know, you're, you're within that uh, property boundary. <clears throat> and then it's just creating new shape files. And again, I'll show you a tutorial of this. And you're collecting points on a map uh, right away, which is really nice. And then you can just link those points, you know, to we've done fillable PDF forms, which I'll show you, um, or just a notebook, you know, have a little notebook there and, and write, you know, whatever information you need to know about that point you're collecting. But we linked ours to a fillable PDF form. So we just had a GPS ID number, and we were able to collect a significant amount of data. This was for uh, roadside erosion. We were also able to take photos and put that photo into the PDF. So then again, we had the GPS point connected to all of this PDF data um, we were collecting in the field. And then there's kind of the gold standard. So we just, uh, moved over to this side of things um, last year. So this is ArcGIS Online. So <clears throat> basically ArcGIS Online is taking the GIS software and putting it into a web browser. So you can open up your maps from any computer, anywhere you have internet, anywhere in the world, which is really nice. But also what's nice about this is you can have a whole office collect data on the same map and collect the same uh, information. So with Arc Online, there are two apps on your phone. Again, you would just collect this data right from your cell phone. Um, and you just set up data sets to go out to the field and collect data. So I know most of you being in the forestry field, you know, you can have uh, numerous things in your data set like tree health, you know, tree species, invasive species. Um, <clears throat> And whatever else you might be collecting in the field and you have it into a data set and everybody just collects the same information um, so this is probably the most expensive version of collecting field data and utilizing it in gis maps um, but it is the most sophisticated and you can you know it has the you know widest range of abilities to collect and map uh, data so there are a couple different free apps you can get with this. So ArcGIS Survey123 and ArcGIS Collector. Um, and again, Survey123 is for collecting, you know, large data sets. So something like this, you know, where I'm collecting, you know, 30 different attributes, including photos. Where ArcGIS Collector is more like opening up an ArcGIS map on your phone. Uh, and just collecting uh, data that way, collecting points, collecting lines, collecting polygons. Um, but again, we use it um, on a more basic level than maybe some engineering firms out there. <clears throat> so, you know, ArcGIS Online, what's nice is you can just have maps that are constantly updated. So, you know, say Joey is in the field collecting data, I could be in the office seeing the data uh, he's collecting in real time, uh, showing up on a map. 
And these are what the um, ARC Online maps look like. Again, just a web browser. I'm just going to show that web browser. So again, you just have a link to the map in ARC Online, and this is your GIS map. So if Jim's up in Wilmington right now collecting data, I could see his points you know, show up. And then you can just something as simple as clicking that point, seeing all the data that is being collected out there. This map you're looking at is for stormwater sampling. So you're collecting all this data and it's automatically in a map. And then even if they took photos, you can click the photo and be like, oh, that's that's where he's collecting data right now. Or it could be, you know, of a building, uh, of a tree, it could be certain attributes on a property. But this is what's really nice uh, about Arc Online uh, software is just the ability to open it and utilize it anywhere and have anybody who is on uh, your license use it. Again, collecting the same data, keeping it real consistent. I know this may seem like a lot, but I just want everybody to know the different um, you know, softwares that are out there and the different ways to collect field data. So you can kind of look into it more on your own and say, hey, I'm more of the, the basic, just getting a simple GPS, collecting some points, collecting some information and putting it on a map and sending it to a coworker, sending it to a customer, uh, whatever it may be. But I'd like you know everybody to know the, the different ways of uh, collecting and utilizing this data. Again, ARC Online. Um, so where to find data, uh, depending on what you're looking for, you know, if you're looking for uh, aerial photos, parcels, streets, uh, elevations, um, that kind of data that the New York State GIS Clearinghouse. Uh, I know not all of you are in New York State, but I only really have experience in New York State, but there should be these databases across all states, including federal databases. Um, but in the clearinghouse, you know, you can collect, uh, download your data by county. Um, and then we also have uh, Cougar, which is the Cornell University Geospatial Information Systems. Um, again, they'll have, they have a lot of natural resource information out there. <clears throat> so hydrology, soils, bedrock, uh, maybe even tree coverage data. Um, so a lot more based on natural resources, ag data. And then web soil survey. So this is something anybody in the United States could use. This is a USDA NRCS. NRCS is the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, web soil survey is downloading the most up-to-date soils information uh, for your area. Uh, and soils being a very important part of everything we do, uh, especially in forestry or me being in natural resources or working with farms or stormwater. Um, soils is always a layer I have on almost every map, um, even before I go into the field. And then other things to look at would be your, your local conservation district. Um, you know, there are conservation districts across the United States. Uh, in New York, they're called soil and water conservation districts. They have slightly different names depending on the state you're in. Uh, but again, we utilize a lot of information for conservation purposes, whether it's working with farms, uh, watershed groups, uh, municipalities. So uh, each district will have a slightly different uh, set of information to be passed on to you if, if you need that. But also look at your local municipalities, your planning departments. Some planning departments have a GIS department. Uh, you can look at New York State DEC or um, your state environmental agency uh, will have a lot of information. So, you know, just asking around on where to find data and usually it's, it's pretty easy to find and somebody can steer you in the right direction uh, pretty easily. So this is uh, just a screenshot from the Cornell University site. Uh, and again, you can browse for different categories like inland, uh, inland waters, properties, geology, environmental data, ag data, different land coverages. Um, different biological data, elevations, transportation, climate. So, um, you know, depending on what you are looking to show on your map or research, uh, there's a lot of information out there. And if you have any questions, even after this, I'm always happy to uh, try to steer anybody that needs some information in the right direction.
And then also, you know, just utilizing Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth is great for historical aerial images. Um, they don't go back super far, but, you know, this, this shows the college, SUNY Adirondack College campus, you know, in 2004. And then in 2011, these are the ag fields around the campus. They expanded, put a new parking lot in here. Um, you can see some drainages in here. You can see where the fields are separated. You know, 2015, again, you can see even which way these fields are draining, uh, depending on the year. You know, you can kind of see this wishbone shape. So, you know, it's some drainage is going through this field. But then if you look over here, they take this portion of the field out of production. Um, so now you can see in 2015, this is out of production for some reason. And then 2018. So in 2018, um, you know, they added a, a three-dimensional look to a lot of more urbanized areas. So you can see the difference where, you know, 2015, the maps are really flat. 2018, you can see the trees, buildings all start to have a three-dimensional look, which is uh, really nice. But again, for seeing different um, land formations, different times of the year. So tree canopy coverage is a big one. So different times of the year, they usually try to take aerial photos when uh, at leaf drop, but it doesn't always happen. Um, and so you can see, you know, especially, you know, working in the forestry area, um, you know, tree canopy coverage can, can mean, um, you know, interpretation of aerial photos at different times of the year. So then, you know, in the end, you really got to ask yourself what kind of failed data you need to collect. Uh, we do a lot of uh, stormwater sampling. We collect a lot of information about culverts uh, and upsizing culverts for um, streams to get better aquatic conductivity. So to get our, our trout in New York State to be able to um, spawn upstream. We work a lot with agriculture. So we work with a lot of farms and collecting a lot of data on farms and farms are ever changing. So um, constantly looking at things like drainage, compaction, erosion, areas of flooding. Um, and so it's nice to have this information on a map, especially kind of just for, you know, year after year. So if in 2011, you know, half of this farm flooded due to Hurricane Irene, um, you know, you can kind of, you can map that area of flooding. So maybe they can slightly change up management um, or look at, you know, maybe utilizing that area for a different purpose, maybe grazing instead of row crops so that you can, if that area ever gets flooded again, you know, they have a permanent cover uh, of grasses on that area. We do a lot of soil testing, whether it's with agriculture or urban ag or other uh, reasons. Um, so we're constantly mapping our soil testing sites, our years of soil testing, so that you can see the changes, whether that's in nutrients or trace metals uh, year after year. So that's all tracked on uh, GIS maps. We do a lot with stormwater. So we're doing watershed assessments, mapping stormwater areas, mapping the flow of stormwater where it outfalls to streams and lakes so that we can uh, you know, write grants and work with the municipalities to uh, clean up that stormwater. And then invasives. Um, again, this applies directly to the forestry field. So we're constantly mapping invasives to um, come up with plans on how to manage these invasives, how widespread these invasives are, are they spreading year after year? Um, and then once you implement a management strategy, uh, is it working, you know, year after year going back into the field, you know, is that area of spread slowing or is it actually reducing? And then we use a lot of this information, again, to get grants and implement programs to uh, reduce or uh, minimize the spread of invasives. Um, outfalls, stormwater sampling. Uh, so again, this is me, this is using the Juno, and I'm uh, sampling the stormwater outfall uh, into one of our canals. And so I'm going to show a quick tutorial, uh, but again, this here's my information. Um, this will be on a recording um, so that, you know, always feel free to reach out to me after this if you have questions on this. And then I figure I would, I would throw in the hemlock woolly adalgid being a forestry uh, group.
So we were out, uh, again, mapping locations of where the hemlock woolly adalgid was in and around Lake George and the spread. So now kind of for the tutorial part, again, QGIS is a, is a free download. Um, you know, there, there are a few odd things about QGIS, again, being free, uh, things you gotta, gotta work around other than paying, you know, for ArcGIS, which is a very honed, sophisticated piece of software. But they do, in general, they do the same things. And what's nice about QGIS is it's constantly being updated. So there are new, new tools that could be utilized um, all the time. So I just wanted to kind of show building a basic map um, and utilizing some field data maybe you would look at collecting and, and putting in a map. So what's nice about QGIS is there's, again, a lot of tools. So, and they're always coming out. So this is out of the Southern California, and this is adding Google Maps to QGIS. <clears throat> so again, if you need aerial photos, this is one way you can directly add Google Maps to uh, QGIS so that you have aerial photos. So basically you go up into these tiles, uh, you do a new connection and all you're doing is connecting a website. Remember how I said in GIS software, you're not actually physically putting the data into the map, you're connecting it to that data in a saved location. So this with Google Earth, you're connecting it to a website. So you're making a connection and basically you're going to enter that website, uh, adjust your zoom level to 19 and name it. And then that's it. And you'll have Google Maps on there. And so they give you the links to all the different Google Maps. So satellites. So we'll do the satellite one. I'm just going to copy this browser link. So a base layer is usually uh, aerial photos um, to start off with to kind of see uh, the area you're working with. So then in these tiles, you just do new connection. And then we're going to name it. So I'll call it, you know, map example. I want the website in there. So I'm just going to paste that in there. And then this max zoom level, they want to at 19. For what reason? I have no idea. I just followed the, you know, couple basic steps uh, and that was it. And then just click OK. And you got your Google satellites in there. So you can either double click it or click and drag. And now you have your uh, Google Maps, your aerial photos in there. So this is kind of the, the basic setup of QGIS. So this is where all your data would go. So this now I have an aerial photo in here um, or ortho, ortho imagery. And then, you know, hovering over each one of these icons will kind of tell you what, you know, uh, their function is, what their tool is. So you got zoom in, zoom out, your pan. So you click the hand and you can move the map around. Uh, opening, <laughs> files, saving. Um, so just getting to know these tools, watching some tutorials, um, you'll be able to, uh, you know, start to understand what each one of these uh, icons will do. So again, it's, it's getting that data. So now that we have aerial photos in here, you know, you can zoom to a location. So if we zoom to the Northeast here, you know, we can see New York State um, and some other information. So I'm going to add, I'm going to add roads. So I have roads information. Oh yeah, let me show um, my GIS setup. So again, remember I talked about it was really important to set up a GIS database. So on a C drive, again, most PCs come with a C drive. It's a pretty much universal drive. So I just set up a GIS folder on there and save all your information in this GIS folder. And that's it, um, pretty basic. So then I have different years of parcels. I have different projects in here, different DEC data, different municipalities. Uh, I got wetlands, county boundaries, 
so saving it all to your C drive um, is really important because then say, you know, your computer is starting to get bogged down um, and you need to get a new computer, you can just transfer this one folder, which holds a significant amount of data and all your maps to a new computer and just put it in the C drive and everything will work for you. Everything will have the same path. Everything is organized. So I recommend if you're just starting out in GIS, this is one of the most important steps uh, to do. Uh, and again, this will keep all your maps working because as soon as you uh, move any of this data to say, I moved it to like a D drive or I moved it to my desktop, it will break all the links in your maps and your data won't show up in your map. So it's really important to keep all your GIS information together. Uh, and as well organized as you can, because uh, you're going to be dealing with a lot of information. So that being said, you know, I set up um, just an example database for uh, the tutorial today. So I've got streets in here for the Warren County uh, in New York. So again, when you're looking at shape files, they're broken up usually between five different files. So this all makes up one data set for my streets. Um, we refer to them as shape files, but once they're in a map, people will just call them layers. So again, you just look for that SHP file. So looking in the type, so I got my streets and I'm looking for SHP, just simple as drag and drop it into a map. And when you're wondering, you can kind of see it popped up here, or if it's not showing up on your map and you're like, wait, where is that data? Again, in your layers file, you got the streets right here. So if you right click on this, it opens up a lot of information, you know, the properties, uh, your attributes. So what data is within that streets file? Uh, but there's also a zoom to layer. So you can just zoom to that layer. Brings you right to Warren County. Here's Lake George. Uh, and there are all your streets. <clears throat> so um, in each layer, you're going to have, you know, what data was collected with that layer. Um, and this is all the data in there. So you got your road name. So, you know, Moffitt Drive, your type of road, the postal code that road is in, the town that road is in, different labels. Um, so, again, there's going to be a lot of information in there. <clears throat> so there's a there is a road name so that's nice so that's all the data within that that file so when you go into properties i'm gonna actually i'm gonna zoom in on an area and take off this photo so i'm just going to zoom into a location so that we can see when i add labels and change So again, you can get to properties, which is kind of the design and information of all uh, that shape file. So over here are your different uh, layer properties. Um, so you can go to labels. Say you want to add labels to your roads, like what's the name of that street? You can add your labels. So just add a single label. And then the value is what is in that attribute table I was just showing. So we'll put it to road name because this has the name of the road. And, you know, then there's all different ways you can change up the text, the size, you know, everything you can do in Microsoft Word, you can change up this text. So you can hit OK. And now you have your different road names on there. <clears throat> so Middle Road, Higgins Road. And then you turn on your aerial photo and you can see where those roads are. So this is all along Lake George. These are the different roads. Uh, roads should really kind of be black. They're hard to see. So again, go to properties. And symbology is changing up the symbol of that road. So you can change, you know, the color to black, make it a little thicker, and then hit OK. And now we can see the roads. But again, it's kind of hard to see the labels. So there's all different things you can do with those labels as well. So under the labels tab, you know, you can set a buffer, which is just a white outline on your label. So I just click draw a buffer. Oh, 
Okay, now you can see, you know, when you zoom in, your roads, your properties, the labels stay out. So now this is, you know, a fairly easily readable map. Um, then I'm gonna pull that off. And then, so I'm gonna show uh, downloading soils information. <clears throat> so again, being in the natural resource field, dealing with forestry, soils is extremely important. Uh, there's a lot of information in soil. So if you just go to web soil survey, this is the USDA NRCS site. So start your web soil survey. There we go. <clears throat> so you can, if you want to download the soils for your entire county or for just a location, you can just search an address. So again, I'm going to search for the college because uh, I'm going to use SUNY Adirondack as an example today. So 640 Bay Road. Very New York. And it brings you right to that location. So again, a lot of the tools are very similar between these mapping software. So this is the pan tool, it's a hand. So I can just move it around. I got the zoom in, zoom out. So I'm gonna just click and zoom out. I'll pan. So this is the entire college campus right here. And these are those ag fields in the back. So I'm just gonna draw an area of interest. And this is a polygon, so AOI stands for area of interest. And you can just draw in where you want your soils. I'm just gonna do the whole campus. I'll make sure I get everything. Just double click when you're done with your area of interest. And now you've got all that area where you're gonna get your soils data. So you just go up to the soils map. And you've got all the soils data for that area. It gives you acres of soils. So the whole area I encompassed was 553 acres. Uh, it gives you the, the different soils for that area. So say I'm looking at, you know, the Oakville Loamy fine sand, uh, which is up here on the map, OAB. So you can click it and it will give you all that information within that soils uh, layer. So, you know, some things to look at um, for any site visit would be, you know, um, you know, frequency of flooding, depth of water table. So very little frequency of flooding. Depth of water table is more than 80 inches. How does it drain over here? How do these soils drain? They're very well drained. Um, and hydrologic soil group also tells you an A means it's um, more of a sandy type soil. So it drains very well. But looking at other soils, so a fluviquint, so this is that, that FU over here. Click on that one. And so if this is a property you're looking at, maybe trying to determine what trees are going to grow where or what you might see, um, or whether you're going to be walking in knee deep water. So these fluviquints, again, very little slope, zero to 3%, so very flat. Uh, depth to water table, zero to 18 inches. So that means uh, part of the time, this water table could be on the surface. So you could have water over here. So this immediately tells me this is a wetland area. Um, let's see, depth of water table, drainage class, very poorly drained. Yeah, very poorly drained because uh, part of the time the water is going to be right on the surface. Hydrologic soil group, so CD. So a C is getting more towards a, a tight soil like a, a silt or a clay. So it's going to have very poor drainage. And what that D means is when this area is saturated, um, it's going to have almost no drainage uh, or very little drainage. So things to look at. So say you want to download this soils data to utilize in your GIS map. You just go to download soils data. And then you just click this to create a download link. And then once it's done, it will give you a link down here. 
and it tells you exactly where you're downloading this data. So, um, you know, Warren County, New York, 553 acres of soil data. So you click this link, which is a zip drive. So I'm downloading five megs of data. And then a lot of times, you know, when you download something, you know, off the internet, it goes to your downloads folder. And so there it is. Um, so those of you who are used to using zip files, uh, you got to extract them or open them in a folder where you can see the information. So a good quick way to do it is open in a Windows Explorer folder. And then here's all your information, all your data. And then here are all your shape files. So we can just, you know, copy that and put it into our GIS database. So I'll just throw it in here for our example. So this is again, C drive GIS database. And then before you use this data, you can name it like, you know, SUNY ADK. And you don't wanna put any spaces in your GIS uh, naming. Um, just a rule to keep everything very well organized, so no spaces. So SUNY Adirondack Soil. So, you know, the soils comes with a lot of different information, um, but the spatial information is going to hold your soil types. So, um, again, you could throw each one of these shape files. So there's one, two, three, four, five shape files in here. Uh, you can throw each one on, find out which one is the soils information you want. But I know from experience, it's your soils and then MU stands for map unit. So again, I'm taking that SHP file, which is the shape file. And I'm just going to drag it onto my map. And again, I'm not over the SUNY Adirondack area. So if you just right click and do zoom to layer, this is the SUNY Adirondack area, and here's all my soils data. <clears throat> so, you know, with the soils data, you can do a lot of things like, I'm just gonna turn off the streets. Um, and you can turn on area photos. Um, so here's the SUNY Adirondack campus, and here's the soils data, so it lines right up for you. To break up this soils information, um, again, you can change the symbol. So it just has one symbol for all your soils information right now. So if you do, um, these, this is the identification tool. So you can click on it and it will tell you, you know, this is the OAB. So this is the Oakville soil where I think this was the, yeah, the fluviquint soil. So these are your attributes in there. So that was the, uh, the soil that was labeled FU. Um, and then, you know, opening up your attribute table will show you all that information as well. So it comes with all of the soil map unit symbols in there. So if I want each one of those soils to look differently so I can show it on a map, go to your properties, and then you've got symbology in here, and you can change that symbol so you want it categorize it and then the value is just under what in your attribute table so the map unit symbol is what i want to categorize it that's that mucm is what people call it but it stands for map unit symbol and then give it a color ramp um you know you can get you know pretty unique with these color ramps but we'll just choose a, a basic one um let's see Choose that color ramp and then classify it, and it just breaks out all your different soils for you. So now your all your soils have a slightly different look to them. So you know, you know, this soil is different from this soil, different from this soil. Um, you know, before you go into the field. And then again, you can just label those soils as well. So go over here, label. Just a single label is all we need. Um, value, so what in the attribute table? Again, we're going to go map unit symbol. 
And then, you know, if we want to turn a buffer on, turn a buffer on, just outlines it in white for you. Now you have all your soils labeled. So turn on your aerial photos and you're like, ah, oh, hey, you know, wait, wait a second here. Um, and this also where um, layering becomes really important. So if I were to move my soils underneath my aerial photos, all of a sudden you can't see them. Um, but if you, this is the, the sandwich of the map. So you move your aerial photos to the bottom. Oh, there are your soils. So organizing your layers is very important to show and make a readable map. Um, and then in your properties, you can also change your symbols. Um, let's see. Do oh, that's right. So in symbology, down here you have a, a layer rendering. So if you click that, you can change the transparency or opacity of that layer. So basically making that soils layer see-through, but you still want to see it slightly. So, I mean, you can go down to like, I don't know, 35, 40%, but again, you can play, play with it. So we'll say, you know, 80% and you can apply, eh, still not opaque enough. You know, maybe bringing it down to like, you know, 38%. Apply, oh, perfect. Hit okay. Now you can zoom into that campus, zoom into the ag field you're working on or forestry plot you're working on. And you can see the different soil types um, in this area. So it's got a Hudson, it's got a Rhinebeck, it's got an Oakville, um, perfect. So Oakville is gonna be very sandy over here. Rhinebeck is gonna be very silty. So these are two drastically different types of soil. Um, so if this was a forestry plot, you could probably expect you know, slightly uh, different tree species to grow in these areas as well. Uh, something that maybe doesn't mind, you know, a little bit more wet feet during a wet summer, um, where this is going to dry out uh, quite a bit midsummer, being a very sandy soil. Um, and so this is kind of, again, now you have a, a basic map. You've got your, your field on there, your plot, and you've got your soil types. Um, also things you can look at doing are depending on the type of data you have. I've got the SUNY Adirondack parcels. So I can put the parcel on there. So the boundary. So this is the property SUNY Adirondack owns. Uh, but again, I'm gonna change that symbol so I can see through it. So I'm on symbology and I'm just gonna do, you know, maybe a, a red outline. So now I can see where the SUNY Adirondack property begins and ends, um, everything in here. So again, if you're out on, you know, doing maybe forestry management plan for somebody and you wanna know what parcels are theirs, you can get that parcel data, um, usually from the county, county has it, but you can also download it. Um, and you can see the approximate boundary of, um, you know, the land you're working with. So then the other thing I want to show is, you know, we have all this soils data. Um, you know, we can, we can clip this soils data to just this boundary line. So if you want to know the exact acreage of, you know, the soils you're dealing with or whatever layer it may be, um, you can cut out the soils information. So these, this is your tools over here. So instead of trying to find a tool, you can just search it. So, and this is something you would learn over time. I know there's a clip tool. Um, again, and it's learning the software and asking around. Um, so I'm gonna double click that clip tool. And then in there, I'm going to put, let's see, my soils layer. So that's my soils layer. And you can just look over here if you forget what it's called, because I didn't rename it. And then I'm gonna put it to the SUNY Adirondack Campus parcel layer. And then you can save it to a location. 
So I'm in my just example. So we'll call this, you know, SUNY oils. So again, no spaces in there. Just saving it as that shape file, SHP file. And then just run that tool. Close. And then you can turn off your original soils file. And now you have the soils just for the SUNY Adirondack campus. And then again, you can just re-symbol those soils, um, you know, turning them on and off. You can see where they are. Um, so it's a, a nice little tool to have. And then you can also create your own, uh, your own plots um, or own shape files. Again, you can, you can collect this data in the field. So say I'm only focusing on this part of the property. So you could take a GPS out to the field and walk it and get just that plot. Um, or even before you go into the field to get an idea uh, of what you're dealing with, you can just create a new shape file. So under the layers, create a layer. Again, we're just creating a new shape file. We'll call it, you know, field uh, one. Um, what do you want to collect? A point, multiple points, a line. We're going to do a polygon because they're going to outline an entire field. Um, you can add attributes in there. So say we're looking at, you know, um, tree type. I can add just a text file in there, add it to the list tree type, or invasive. Are there any invasives over in this area? Add that to the field. Um, you know, let's see. What are the things would I add? You know, if you're in a field, I could add, you know, a crop. Or maybe they're using a certain best management practice. You can use practice in there. And then just hit OK. And it created that layer. And if you open it up, so you have all those you know, different attributes you can collect. But we just created this layer, so we have no information in there. So to create it, you just this is the edit tool. So it's just a pencil, you know, you're editing. And then again, if you hover over these, it'll tell you what each of these tools do. So I wanna add a polygon. So I'm just gonna quickly outline this field, nothing too accurate. And then when you're done, you just right click and then you can add all that information in there. So we're just gonna give us an ID of one tree type, you know, maybe it's oaks invasive, you know, maybe there's some knotweed over there. Practice. Um, I don't even know what practice I'd put in there. You know, if it was agriculture, I'd say maybe like cover crops. Oops. Crops. And it creates that file for you. And then if you click off editing, it's going to tell you to save. And you're saved. And then, you know, again, you can change it to a simple line. Uh oh, freezing up. Oh, now I did it. I froze it. But that was basically, you know, everything I wanted to show um where you can get a, a basic understanding of creating a map getting data and and utilizing that data um you know i'd be happy to take some questions as i'm uh, i'm frozen here <laughs> jeez good job nick i'm glad my computer is not the only one that freezes yeah. and i get the not responding <laughs> yeah you know I, uh, I, yeah, I was, I was clicking through to get done as, as quick as I could and wasn't letting it catch up. Yep. Um, so there, but, yeah. 
so there are some questions. I've got a couple to start with, and if others have questions, this is a good time to start um, typing them in. So going back, you said you mentioned two apps, I think, uh, ArcGIS Survey and then ArcGIS Collector. So those are those are free apps that that work um, in alignment with the ArcGIS online. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So, so once you so have, you would, you would load you would load those on your tablet or on your your handheld GPS unit or where do those on your come? cell phone on your cell phone yeah okay or your tablet yep. and then are all of those available both as um, Apple iPhone products as well as Android or yes it, okay yep. so just wherever you get your typical apps you would look for those in in your app store correct yep. So yeah, once you have the ARC Online uh, license, uh, these are just uh, free apps to put on your cell phone and immediately start collecting data in the field. Okay. Um, you showed um, repeated measurements of storm drains and, and things like that. And there was some conversation about repeat about accuracy of locating the point. So if you go back to a storm drain, you're not going to get, you know, if you're standing there, you're going to be, even if you're in exactly the same spot because of, you know, satellites and variability, you're not going to get the exact same location. Does that, does that confuse uh, your, how, how does, how, I mean, how do you manage now, that? So even, even a four, even four meter accuracy will get you back to that storm, storm drain or, stormwater outfall no problem because right. think about if you hold your arms out i'm six foot tall my wingspan is about six feet that's that's two meters of accuracy right there so if you're standing on a storm drain you know two meters of accuracy is holding your arms out right but when you're standing i, I mean so i know you could find it right a storm drain you know it's in the road or you've got a culvert and it's like obviously there even if you're off by whatever but when you're standing in that same spot and you say, okay, GPS unit, where am I? And it gives you a latitude and longitude. That's not going to be the same as you collected last year. So, uh, do you, so do you, I mean, does it have to be, I mean, how do you, does and, and, and it may just be that it's okay. It doesn't matter, but how do you, how do you deal with the, the lack of precise precision? Right. So say you're collecting multiple years of data. Is that kind of what you're discussing? Right. right. Does, it yeah. does, it, does it matter that the Latin lawn is not, or UTM coordinates or whatever you're using, does it matter no. that those are not identical? No, they'll be so close together on a map. Um, and again, if you're collecting multiple years of, of data, you can just have them in separate layers. All right. So you could turn off the 2020 data and just put on the 2021 data. Okay. Um, and again, those points will pretty much overlap. Um, and you know, when you collect data, it collects a bunch of points around you, and then it averages those points for the most accurate point. Um, yeah, so unless you're collecting points within six inches of themselves, which you know, I don't know who collects data that close. Right. Um, you know, that that would be the only thing. Uh, but I mean, even if you're collecting points and say. You're collecting two trees or two objects on a site that are 10 feet apart it'll be noticeable on a map okay um and then my final question there were several others typed in already if uh what's so if somebody's like all right i'm gonna do this and they're struggling to get started um is there is there like a standard local per i mean like they every like in New York, at least every county has a soil and water conservation district. Is that a good place to start and call and say, hey, I'm trying to figure this out? I mean, are, are all these districts going to have somebody like your parallel in those districts or maybe not so much? Uh, districts are slightly different uh, across the state and across the country. Um, certainly, it's, it'd be worth reaching out to a district and say, hey, do you guys deal a lot with, uh, you know, utilizing GPSs and collecting field data and utilizing it in GIS software, whether that's ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, it'd be a good place to start. If you're in a larger city or a more urbanized area, um, your planning department is a great location to start. Uh, and a lot of times they'll have a GIS specialist 
um, in that department. Uh, if you have any friends that work in uh, engineering firms, um, a lot of engineering firms uh, deal a ton with collecting field data and utilizing NGIS. Um, and, you know, just asking around, um, you know, again, DEC in New York State or your local state environmental agency, they collect a ton of field data. So they'll be a, a great resource as well. Um, I guess if you've had your property surveyed, then your surveyor probably uses all, yep. is it safe to say all surveyors nowadays have some GIS capabilities? Yeah, pretty safe to say, um, certainly. And, you know, a survey quality versus non-survey quality, if, unless you're a surveyor, there's really no reason to have survey quality. Um, of course, if you're working for an engineering firm and you need to be very, very precise with, you know, building offsets and codes, um, survey quality is going to be used there. But I don't know anybody um, other than engineering firms and surveyors that use survey quality. Right. But um, in terms of like think, yeah. they're they're getting started and they've got the software yeah. loaded and like, all right, I don't know which button to click next if they've got a relationship, whether with the solar water district or a surveyor. I mean, those are those are the kinds of local people that they can potentially reach out to to get more information. Yeah, certainly. That's okay. uh, that's a great question. Yep. OK. All right. So can you see the chat window or do you want me to read the questions? What's going to be easiest for you? Let's see. Let me stop. Uh... Stop share here. Oh yeah, we got 49. Um, let's see. So the question started about uh, 1216, I think. 1216, I'll shoot up there. Um, are these, uh, is QGIS? basically available in just Windows or is it available on Mac? It is available on Mac as well. And you'll see that at the download. Um, it'll ask about the different um, softwares you're using. Uh, trying to find a survey corner pin in the woods with three meter precision is frustrating. I don't need centimeter survey grade, but will a cell phone with an add-on device get me to one meter? So survey pins can be difficult, um, again, because they're often hidden. So I, I do understand that. Um, if it's a, you know, survey pin, it, it can be difficult because, again, you're dealing with a, and it depends on, what it depends on is um, where you're getting your data from for that survey pin. But if you're, if you found that pin and you took a GPS point, Obviously, you would mark it better than just uh, a pin in the ground where you have to use a metal detector. So I, I would think three meter accuracy is more than enough to get you back to a survey pin uh, that you already know is showing. Um, but if you have no idea where the survey pin is, three meters is going to be difficult because, again, where are you getting your data from to bring you back to that point? Um, but if you logged that point, it should get you back there pretty easily. How, how uh, with the, with the glow two do you get do you get one meter of resolution with the glow two? No, I usually don't. Um, depending on where I'm at, if I'm in, you know, more open in the city, um, you know, I'm getting three meter accuracy. If I'm, you know, have more coverage, I'm on the outskirts um, in the woods. Maybe it's more like, you know, four or five meter accuracy. Um, and that's with the, the Garmin Glow hooked to yeah. the cell phone. And that's um, what, when I, when, after I talked to you and Jim earlier, I went out and I got a Garmin Glow and I was yeah. working in the woods, essentially in a double canopy. So there's a beach understory and then a mature overstory. And I was getting like 14 feet of accuracy reported, which, oh, was, yeah. and, which was like, I mean, I don't know if you're trying to find a survey pin within a 14 foot radius of where you are, that's going to be, as Mark says, frustrating. Um, but in terms of like marking stand boundaries or roughing and skid trails, that's that's decent. Yeah, but if you're previously marking that point on your cell phone um, with a GPS and you want to get back to that point, it, it will get you back there. Um, right. And again, you know, with a, a survey pin, 
I put another marker around there or label it in your attributes say, okay, this pin is right next to a, you know, um, 14 inch diameter red oak, you know, so that you have a, something to go back to. Right. Um, I'd like to take the county parcel from our local county parcel viewer. JS website, layer website, right? Just to do that via. So <clears throat> this person, um, uh, Jeremy wants to get uh, a parcel. I would go to your um, county planning department and ask for those parcels. They'll give you the full county parcels, most likely. Um, it varies municipality and municipality, but you can also download them a lot of the time. Um, and then layer it over the web soil survey map. Or hover onto or hover or over in a Google Earth map. How do you best do this via QGIS? Um, so I think what you're asking is get those parcels with the soils map. Um, what's nice in I'll show you real quick in QGIS or in a Web Soil Survey. Oh, I have it up right here. You can actually put the shape file right into Web Soil Survey. So import an area of interest and create from a shape file. So again, you just load you know the four files in a shape file. There are five, but it's only asking you to load four, and it will take you. Uh, it will outline that exact parcel data in Web Soil Survey. So I don't know if that answers your question there. Um, but that should allow you to use just the soils data for your uh, parcel. And utilize that right in QGIS. Uh, can you zoom to data within a data file there? Zoom into just that data? Not sure exactly what that question is asking. So the, the next the next statement answered that question, I think. So oh. Tim Tim responded to Mark. Oh yep, yep. Yes, uh, click on the layer name, uh, zoom to layers. Yeah, you can zoom to any of those layers and open the attribute, and that will give you all the data in that layer. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'd be happy to send out a PDF of the instructions um, to get, um, whether it's this tutorial, my uh, PowerPoint, or getting the Google Earth layers into QGIS. I'm happy to send Peter that information and, um, and get it sent out to anybody who would like that. That'd be great. And I can yep. send it to everybody that's registered. And I'll also um, open up a blog on our blog site and then have it there as a repository for people in the future that want to be able to find it. That'd be super. Mm -hmm. um, after downloading the shape file, uh, let's see. So somebody's asking about the, the letter IDs of the soils after downloading it. Um, those were the, the, the same IDs. Those were the map unit symbols. So when I downloaded the soils data, it didn't come with all that information that's on Web Soil Survey, um, but you can print out all that information for all those soils or just um, get it as a, save it as a PDF, but only the map unit symbols come over with the soils data because it's, it's an insane amount of data in Web Soil Survey, um, but you can get that. So if you're interested in more in depth, soils information to use in web soil survey, um, contact your local NRCS office. That's USDA NRCS. Uh, somebody's asking about the webinar recording. Yep. I wanna know how to get that. It's on YouTube. Okay. Or it will be. How do you tell if a data set we've imported has uh, good accuracy? So again, a line on a map. So that parcel line I was showing you on a map, in real life, that parcel line would be 15 feet wide. Um, and those, those parcels are not survey accurate, but they are a very, very good reference point. Um, 
you know, survey accurate is going to be going out and marking that survey pin with your GPS. Um, that's going to be more accurate than those parcel lines. Uh, but it'll give you a very good idea of what those property boundaries are. Um, what apps to use with QGIS with an iPhone? I haven't used QGIS with an iPhone, but I know, um, I think it can be downloaded to a cell phone. I haven't actually utilized it in a, in a cell phone app. Um, but that's a good question, something I can certainly look into. Um, I would just go to your app store and, and or go to the QGIS website and see what they offer for downloads. Because certain downloads are for desktops, uh, different softwares, certain uh, downloads are for tablets, I think. And they might, they might have it on a cell phone. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, and I'm not uh, familiar with is it Gaia GPS? So I've used Gaia GPS just to collect simple like boundary lines on fields and trails and stuff like that. And then I, you can export, I don't remember if it's KMZ or KML files that I upload yeah. to, to Google Earth Pro. Yeah. So I mean that, so I, I'm assuming if you can do that to Google Earth Pro that you could do something similar with QGIS. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Max don't have a C drive. So um, I'm not really a Mac user. So whatever the universal drive is on a Mac is where I'd put your GIS drive. And it's extremely important to save all your, your data. Um, you don't have to save your, your documents into your GIS drive, but if you're dealing with a, a project, it's, it's not a bad idea to have it all in the same place. Um, so yeah, again, having that universal drive on PCs, it's a C drive for most of them. Um, or you just create a C drive and ask any IT person about creating that. Um, it certainly can be done. Uh, or just creating that path is really what needs to be done. Does your cell phone need to be connected to the internet while in the field? No, it doesn't need to be connected to the internet, uh, but it will use data for satellites. Um, so, and it will use a good amount of data. And then, so if you're offline and collecting data um, is one of the questions, um, can it then be transferred to your PC? So the only experience I have of collecting data offline, um, most, most of the time you are offline uh, if there's no internet coverage in the area and the data can just be uploaded or transferred later. Um, I deal with that all the time. But again, your cell phone still will connect and use data uh, to connect to satellites. And then uh, one was the three meter accuracy with the survey pin, can of talked about that. Planning department is a great place to start for finding um, GIS uh, shape files and information. Just downloaded it to an iPhone. I'm not sure. Oh, QGIS maps can be downloaded to a cell phone uh, with Avenza maps. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people, actually a lot of hunters I know use Avenza maps. Um, and yeah, with, with QGIS, you can export the map as a PDF or as a, a number of different files. Um, so it can be used in, in different software programs. So if you're using an app with a tablet, you do not need to be in active connection with a carrier while gathering data in the field. Yeah, you, you have to, Let's you see. have to have a you have to have a, a yeah. cell signal, right? Yeah, you have to have a, a cell signal. Um, so I, I mean, Freda lives way out in the hills, and I'm not sure if she would have well, a, a cell yeah. signal at all parts of her property. Um, I mean, once you're connected to the satellites, you're usually pretty free to roam about. 
Um, so, if you're getting a, so, it, so, if, so, so, if, so if you're getting a satellite signal for your GPS, is that sufficient or would you need to yes, be able to? Yes. So, all right, so, the, you, so you don't need the to external, be able to. Um, with the external GPS, that will do it for you. So if you have a Garmin Glow, it will connect pretty much anywhere you can think of to the satellites. And that's really what you need. And then the, the cell phone is just the uh, for collecting the data. But the Garmin Glow is going to do all the connecting to the satellites for you. Okay. Oh, if you do not have a carrier for your device and they can only connect via Wi-Fi, you don't need to be Wi-Fi connected at all. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure um, how that would work without without a carrier. But, oh, looks like I answered the question. <laughs> well, you're welcome if I answered it. Google Maps has an offline feature. Uh, will that allow for data collecting with a good location data? Like collecting data in the field with Google Maps? I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that works. But there are a lot of apps out there. Like if you go back and watch Jim's presentation, uh, he shows examples of using different apps to collect uh, field GPS data. Oh, Q field for QGIS is an equivalent to ArcGIS collector. Oh, that's great to know. I have not used Q field um, again because we we moved over to Arc Online for collecting our field data. Um, I haven't gone much past just utilizing QGIS in the des desktop version, or I used it utilized it on a tablet in the field. Um, again, which on a tablet, you're basically kind of using the desktop version uh, to collect data. So what again, field, what, that's great. So what does the ArcGIS collector or the Q field, what is, what's the function of that app? So uh, Q field from the sounds of it uh, is an app you can download on your phone. Um, and it will basically put QGIS on your phone in a sense. Okay. And you can collect data using that app. So like, That's cl great. like collect trails and way, waypoints yep. and stuff like that. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Neat. I'm going to write that one down and check that out. See, learn something new every day. And that's, yeah. that's what the GIS world, there's, there's a lot of different ways to, to utilize it. You know, people have GPS watches now, Garmin watches. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different things that collect data. I watch tells me how far I walk when I cut the lawn and I use that to just <laughs> I use that to justify eating more cookies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I appreciate that. That's great. Uh, so and maybe the last question um, I'll I'll close off with. There's a lot of people like the QGIS seems like a great starting point. If somebody gets into QGIS and they realize, all right, I really need to go uh, whole hog with the uh, ArcGIS. Well, well, all of the, they've got a folder, a GIS folder on their C drive or wherever it is on their Mac. Can they just buy into ArcGIS and then start accessing all of that same data? Is it? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. QGIS and ArcGIS use, both use shape files and same data. So I could have had both maps up and I could have just added that same data to both maps. Okay. All right, cool. Well, Nick, I want to thank you. This was great. And the, the participants had some really fun questions and, and shared, asked questions as well as uh, shared some good information. So I appreciate that. So we'll close the noon session and we'll look forward to seeing Nick back this evening. And any of you that want to come back this evening to see it once again, you're welcome to. It'll be the, essentially the same presentation. So. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We appreciate it. It was a great job. I learned a lot. So <laughs> appreciate it. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.